Man, I, I know I say this about every Sunday morning after our praise and worship time, but wow. Amen. Man, this is some good stuff, and I pray and that you have enjoyed participating in worship with us today and through our praise and worship. Well, it's time for our kids, first uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, that we have children's church right over here, so uh, these ladies are ready for you. So kids, come on down. Wow. Look at this. All right. Man, this is a, this is a thrill to the pastor's heart. First, actually the thrill is seeing so many, seeing them all leave because I'm not going to get to preach to them is heartbreaking, but no, it, but man, isn't this great? Give it a hand. This is amazing. I love it. You guys have a great time, and as parents, remember that the kids will not be coming back in here after the worship service. They'll meet you in the fellowship hall, so as soon as this service is over, you can be dismissed and go through uh, the entranceway over there to the Welcome Center and right on through across the hall, and that's where our children will be at the end of this service today, okay? But man, it's exciting to see uh, that many kids here at First Baptist West. We're excited about that. Today, again, happy Father's Day to all of you dads here and you at home or, or wherever you are watching this. Just a uh, happy Father's Day, and I hope that it's going to be a great day for you. And I had an opportunity to uh, be with my girl, a couple of my girls yesterday. Of course, Sherry, of course, you all know, is in Prague, and so uh, I'm not going to get to be with her. Hopefully in the fall, we'll get to be with her. Uh, but the other two were with me yesterday, had a great day, and uh, uh, celebrated Father's Day yesterday. So... I hope that you all have a great day. Today what I want to do in, with Father's Day is I want to share a message, though, that's for all of us. It's a message that we all need to hear, and it is about the family because I believe the family is an important thing. And the title of my message today is Protecting Families. That's what God would have us do as dads, but also as moms, but also as children, that we all ought to be called to, to protect the family and the church. The church should be called. That, that should be one of our focuses is to protect the family. Because my friends, listen to me. The family is in danger today. Our society does not promote family. They do not promote it the way God would want it to be. And, and I am convinced that from the beginning, God established the family. When he created Adam and Eve and told them to be fruitful and to multiply, that he ordained the family. And I am so convinced that as the family goes, so goes a nation. And if the family is not protected, then my friends, our nation is not going to be protected. Our world is not going to be protected. Because the, the force of society should be the family. And so we as the church, I as a dad, you dads, you moms, but even we who are children, we're somebody's kids, amen? We should also protect our family that is not just our immediate family, but our extended family, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins. We should be protecting. So today what I want to do is I want to look at this message of protecting the family and actually see I believe what the Bible tells us that we've got to do and that we better have if we're going to actually protect this precious thing that God has given us called the family. I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14 at three things that I found here that I believe are going to be vital to the existence of our families here at this church, at other churches, and in, in society. So if you have a moment, let's stand, and you're able to, would you please stand in honor of reading God's Word. You join us at home as we read the Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. It says here for us to watch, be alert, if you will, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. Father, we thank you. For, for this time of praise and worship that we had, we thank you for the sweet spirit that's in this place and God for just being able to hear the praise team and the choir and our congregation sing with such passion. Lord, that's an in encouragement. That's an inspiration. 
And I thank you for that time we just experienced. And now, Lord, as we step on into your word, I pray that that same spirit, that same passion, would be able to be sensed from, from this word and from this pastor. And Father, as I always pray that today these words that I'm about to say, they'll not be my words, but Lord, they're your words. And I pray that the message that I'm about to share is not my message, but is the one that you gave me. And just as well as that, the response that everybody has is not going to be the way I want it to be, but the way you want. That, Father, we can honor and glorify you through it. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As I said, this should be the focus of individual Christians as well as the church is protecting the family. We have such a strong emphasis on that here at First Baptist West. As a matter of fact, if you'll remember when, when we were looking to fill that position of our associate pastor for music, one of the things that I shared with you that I was so felt so led of God was to form and bring someone in that would also be able to establish our family ministry. And, we, and Patrick has come in and he's done such a great job bringing our directors together of our ministries and, and forming a, a focus on families. And man, I'm excited about what they've already done, but I'm even more excited about what they're going to do. Because I believe, again, it is our job as the church to focus on families, to minister to families, to bring families in, to get, get them to be a part of, of the church. Because they are an endangered group and Satan is looking to devour the, the, the family. Because again, as the family goes, so goes a nation. So what are we supposed to do? How do we do that? How do we, how do we protect the family? How do, we, how, do, how do we make sure the family is what God wants it to be? How do, we, how do we encourage the families? Well, the first thing that we do, whether you're a dad, whether you're a mom, or you're just a, you're just a child because we're all children. The job that we're supposed to do is very first of all, it says, be on guard or, or to watch. Constantly be aware of the surrounding of your family. Constantly be knowing what's going on in your family. Now, not digging into everything that goes on, but to be aware, to, to constantly be on guard. And the thing that you've got to understand that we need to understand is that this is a constant action. This is not something we can take some time off on we can't say you know what we've done we've been working real hard at this we protected it so let's just for a while step back and not worry so much about the spiritual movements of our family why should it be constant why should it be something that we're always going after because the bible tells us in first peter 5 8 it says be sober be vigilant that means again be constant be focused all the time because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Can I tell you, my friends, Satan is constantly looking to destroy families. He is after your family. He is after my family. He is after our church's families. He is after the families of society. My friends, he is wanting to destroy your family. And he's going to do anything that he can. He's not going to let up. He's going to throw things at you. He's going to be bringing things into your path. He's going to do everything he can to get your family to literally fall apart. And because he is not giving up, then you and I can't either. Amen? We can't step back. We can't say, well, we've done a good job so far. You know what? Let's just relax a little bit. I don't have to. Preacher, you're getting just a little bit wild here. You're getting a little bit crazy thinking that we've got to constantly be aware. Well, the Bible just tells us. Be sober. Be vigilant. Always watching because, my friends, Satan is not giving up on destroying your family. And can I tell you, we're going to talk about it just a little bit longer here in just a little bit. But can I tell you, he is so after your kids. Let me say that again, folks. Satan is after your kids. And he is not going to give up. He is not going to step away. He is not going to say, well, that family's off limits. He's coming after your kids. And we better be vigilant. We better be watching. We better be doing everything we can to protect them. You as a mom and a dad, us as a church... 
protecting them. And it's constant. But not only that, but I, I want to look at, if you will, three uh, works of Satan that I believe that he uses against family. Now, when I read this and I was doing the research, I found this from uh, Francis Dixon. Now, this one, what, what they came up with, what he came up with was about the church. But when I saw these three things, I thought, you know what? This is exactly toward the family. And Satan is going to use these three things that I want to share with you very quickly that I believe that he's going to use to destroy your family. He's going to use to try to get your, your kids. The first one is division. Satan wants to divide families. He wants to separate you. He wants to divide you in, in, in mentality. He wants, to, uh, he wants to divide you in how you perceive things. He wants to divide you in how you, uh, you're, you're, you're thinking about with your kids. Now, there's always been a gap between kids and parents. Amen? I know that. I'm a parent. I've got daughters. I know they don't always like everything I do and don't always agree with what I do, even though it's right. <laughs> Amen? But I know there's a natural division. But what, what we have to be careful, though, is to not let our philosophies be div divisive. Our, the way that we approach things to be divisive. We are living in what I believe today is the most divided society, in a time in society that I think we've ever experienced. And we are living in times where, the, the, can, can I tell you this, where the government, where the society is trying to, they're trying to teach your kids stuff that aren't true. They're trying to indoctrinate them into thinking of things that are not scriptural. And we are seeing that kids are not thinking anywhere near close to what parents. Kids are beginning to uh, be taught and to, and, and even from, men, they start, they don't start when your kids are teenagers. They start when they're little, little ones and indoctrinate them where they come up and they don't have to teach them. It becomes who they are. And they're wanting to divide the, how the parent feels and a child feels. We're living in a time now that even with, uh, with the COVID and different things, we have seen a division in families like never before. Just your philosophy about the whole COVID incident, about wearing a stupid mask or not wearing a stupid mask, getting a shot or not getting a shot. We, we've seen, and Satan's goal is to divide the family where they're not together on things. They're not thinking the same way. They're not wanting to be together. As a matter of fact, they would be more happy to separate than to be together. That's this tool that Satan is using. And I'm not coming on any of those sides, folks. I'm just letting you wake up and to see that this is real. Satan is using his powers to divide families. The second one is diversion. He wants us to get sidetracked from spiritual family things to basically secondary stuff that doesn't matter. He wants us to get so busy with stuff that, that we forget about the spiritual. The devil gets the family so absorbed with secondary, secular things that we don't have time for church. We don't have time for prayer together as a family. We don't have time for devotions as a family. We don't have time to do anything because we're so busy running from here to there, one thing to the next. One, you take them and I'll take them. and We'll all meet here maybe if we have time. And my friends, listen to me. He is diverting the attention from our needs as a family to our wants. And he is bringing about all sorts of diversions to cause us to lose focus on him and his desire to go against the family. So it's a diversion. The third one is disaffection. Now this disaffection is also very dangerous because this is one where the devil's most subtle methods of seeking to upset the family is to get members thinking something is better somewhere else. I would be better if I was over there than here with my family where I am now. I'm losing this affection toward them. We, we like to make a simple term called the grass is greener somewhere else. We look at somebody else. We look at something else other than our family. And we want to put our affections over there because that looks better to me. That feels better to me. That 
understands me better than my family does. That grass is always greener somewhere else. But can I tell you, from my years of living in Milfay, Oklahoma, all right, as a teacher and a coach, in Milfay, Oklahoma, it was about the size of almost this church. The whole town was not much bigger than our block. Well, we didn't have, uh, we, we didn't have rural water and we didn't have rural uh, sewer systems. We had wells. And we had old lateral line system, you know, where we had the septic tank and the lateral lines. Well, something occurred every summer in Milfay, Oklahoma. In the I, I had to, I mowed my yard, I mowed uh, the church, and I mowed uh, uh, the, the kind of the little field that we owned uh, from the church. And so I'd mow that. Well, our lateral lines from my house ran out into my yard and then out across into the fields. <clears throat> well, every summer. Every summer, the grass would die because it was hot and it was dry. And I wouldn't mow so much. But I'm telling you, there were about four lines out in that field that were about as green and plush as you could make them. As a matter of fact, I had to get my lawnmower out and go push it over there to mow four big, thick, green lines. Well, sometimes something would go wrong with those lines, and I would have to dig down in there to repair it. And do you know what I discovered underneath that real big, thick, green, plush grass? Sewer. Yuck. Nasty stuff. So I learned very quickly, when the grass is greener than where you're standing, You better be careful what's underneath the grass. Can everybody say amen? amen? My friends, listen to me. Satan tells men. He tells women. Hey, look over there. That's where your affection needs to be because it's greener over there than where it is right now. You're living in a brown area, but man, look at the green. Can I tell you, anytime Satan tells you that grass is greener over there, please remember my story and what you're about to start stepping into. Amen? But can I tell you, listen, can I tell you that's what Satan uses? He uses this disaffection. I put my affections in places that it should not be put because I think it's better there than what I have. Just please remember what it is. And that's why the Bible tells us, that's why, that's why Paul tells us, to, to, I've learned to be content in all things, whether I'm a base or a bound, whether I got little or I got a lot, I've learned to be content because he knows that if I'm not content, if I as a husband, if I am a dad, as, if I am as, even as a pastor, am not content where God has me, and I begin to look and put my affection somewhere else, I am going to be led astray, and my friend Satan wants that to happen. So guys, ladies, be content where you are. Know that God has placed you where he wants you, and if you want that grass to be green, water it. You don't have to go finding green grass with a bunch of manure under it. Take care of your grass. But Satan uses these three tools. And he is very successful. Look at our society. Look at our churches even. And I'm telling you, he is working overtime to destroy families. So, the second part to that of being on guard is know that this is a spiritual battle. This is spiritual. Everything that we deal with, everything that's coming after you, oh, it may be physical stuff. It may be troubles with, with the job. It may be troubles even in your marriage. It may be troubles financially. It may be troubles with all sorts of things, health, whatever it is. But can I warn you that it is a spiritual battle, and we need to understand that because the Bible tells us right here in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it tells us, 
that, that, I'm sorry, yeah, Ephesians 6, 12, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This isn't a physical battle, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So what this is telling us is that it's not a spiritual battle because, I mean, it is a spiritual battle and it's not physical because there's so many times we will divert our attention to the physical stuff. I'll work harder. I, 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 will, I will cut more places. I will do all of these things with the hopes that it will be better. And my friends, listen to me. It is all a spiritual battle. It is Satan attacking us and we need to be prepared. And the way that we're going to be prepared is to not be ashamed. Be prepared. And, you, and the Bible tells us in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. And you say, well now, Pastor, what does not being ashamed have to being with prepared? Because here's what we've got to understand. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel. And one way that I believe that we say, well, I'm not ashamed of it, but we are ashamed of it, is that we don't know what this says. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to know this. To be prepared against the spiritual battle of Satan, you and I need to know what this Bible says. We cannot neglect this word. We've got to know it. So you say, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, do you study it? Do you read it? Do you, do you take it out more than the Sunday morning whenever the preacher says, stand in honor of reading God's word? My friends, I hear a lot of Christians over and over, solid believing Christians, or they declaim it, tell me, Pastor, it's not necessary for us to study, read every single day. My friend, listen to me. That's what Satan wants you to think. Be prepared by knowing Knowing what it says, but not only knowing what it says, but also be prepared and not ashamed of it by living it. If you know what it says, then the second thing you need to do is live it. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll live it in church. I'll, do, I'll, I'll be this on church on Sunday morning. But now when I go to work or when I go to school on Monday, that's a whole different ballgame. You know what the Bible just said you're doing? You're being ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know it, then live it. Let people see the gospel through you by being prepared. Man, you're preparing for battle by knowing this and living it. And the third thing that it says to do is to then share it. If you're not sharing this gospel, if you're not giving the good news of, of Jesus to the people around you, then you're saying, I am ashamed of the gospel. When you say, no, pastor, I'm not ashamed. I'm just, I, I feel a little awkward sharing it. Listen, if you believe that this is the power of God unto salvation, that we're not ashamed of it, my friends, we need to start telling people the good news. Tell people why we have hope. We need to be telling them reason that there's hope in me, reason there's hope in you. And it's not because we're good. It's not because we're better. It's because and only because of Jesus. The gospel, the good news. Jesus Christ came to redeem the world. And through him we can have eternal life. Through him we can be rescued. That, my friend, is the gospel. So if we're going to really be on guard with our family, we got to know this thing. We've got, to show, we've got to live it, and we've got to show it. The second thing, very quickly, is to stand fast in faith. If we're going to defend our families, we're going to protect our families, folks, you and I, we got, we got to stand up. we got to stand fast in faith. You know one of the first parts of standing fast is? Having mature stability. <laughs> in other words, hey, folks... It's time for us to grow up. Amen. Hey, man, it's time for us to be men. Not, not boys, not overgrown boys, not men who are trying to hold on to their boyhood. It's time to grow up and be men. It's time to take on the responsibilities that God has placed on us. It's time to maybe turn off a few of those electronics and, and get into life and guarding your family. 
Ladies, it's time to grow up. It's time to quit being worried so much about all your stuff and start being concerned about your family. It's time to be putting the family first. That's mature stability. The Bible says says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of the men and the cunning and craftiness of of, of, of the deceitful plotting. Can I tell you, it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to mature because Satan is after us and he is after you and he is after your kids. Grow up. Stand up. Be strong. The second part of that is consistency. This is, this is difficult. This is to be consistent. This is to keep going, to be steadfast. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be immovable. Know what you believe. Know what the gospel says. Know that you're going to defend your family. Know that you're going to guard your family. It does not matter what anybody else says. It does not matter what anyone else is doing. What matters is you know what God has called you to do. Stand up. Be mature. Grow up. And be consistent. And be steadfast and movable. No matter what anybody else says. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always doing What you know this gospel is telling us to do as moms, as dads, as children. Grow up, be strong, be consistent, be immovable. And here's the promise. Knowing that your labor, knowing that the work you put into it is not going to be in vain. When you stand up and you're strong and you're courageous and you're defending your family and you're guarding them against the wiles of Satan and the deceitfulness of men and the plotting and the cunningness that the world has against you and your family, I promise you, you're going to benefit from it. Because our family needs that. They need it from husbands. They need it from wives, moms, dads, children. They, all, they need it from everyone. So that's the second one. That's, it's difficult, but to stand fast in faith, not being tossed by every little thing that comes our way or that the society tells us to do. And the third thing, do it in love. Do it in love. Look at your family and love them. In other words, the, be cheerful. Cheerfully giving to our families. Not having to declare all the time, all the great sacrifices that I give to you kids. Oh. (laughs) Cheerfully give to them. Cheerfully give to our families. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that that we, we are to do everything we do with love. That if we don't do it with love, we're just a bunch of, Clanging cymbals and loud noise and stuff. But you do it out of love. And he says, man, that's an amazing thing. As a matter of fact, he says you can do the same task with two different motives and have two different results. You can do the same thing but out of obligation. Or you can do it out of love and you're going to get two different results. Because if you do something out of obligation, you're going to get mean, hard, cold, and judgmental. If you do it out of love... Oh, it's the same task, but I promise you it's going to mean something to you and it's going to mean something to them because your family will realize that you care rather than you have to or you're supposed to. So we do it out of love. And the last thing that I want to wrap up, my, it's, it's time to close it off here. But I believe this other one is doing it out of love is, is, is basically know why we're doing what we do. Know why we do what we do. One of, my, one of my favorite texts in the Bible is found in the book of Nehemiah. Now, all of you know that Nehemiah was coming back to build the wall around Jerusalem. It had been destroyed all those years. He was coming from captivity, and he was given the task to build the wall. Now, while he built the wall to, guess what, to protect the city 
to be on guard against the enemy, to constantly be aware that the enemy was coming after them, so they needed that protection. They were building that wall, and he had his enemy come after him. The enemy was saying, this is crazy you're doing it. You can't do it. You're not supposed to do it. How dare you do it? And if you keep it up, we're coming after you. So Nehemiah prayed, and he went to such an extent that he, if you'll remember, he took all the laborers, everybody in the, that were working, and he divided them into two groups. He had a group of builders, and while that group was building, then he had a group of protectors. And they were the ones who were armed, and they were ready and, and on guard to fight the enemy. He even went as far as saying to them, if you're working even, I want you to be on such guard that I want you to carry your weapon with you. That at a moment's notice, at any point, you could stop working and go right into battle because you've been on guard. And now they were being discouraged. Man, they were, these people were discouraged. And so when we look at this, knowing why we're doing what we do, here's what Nehemiah told them. Here is the whole reason that we are, the thing that you and I need to do as parents, but as kids as well, here's what we need to do. He told them, he said, don't be afraid of them. In other words, he said, man, don't be afraid of that enemy. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. Hey, didn't we just spend 30 minutes or more singing about that great and awesome Lord? Didn't we just talk about our sing? Oh, how wonderful you are. How amazing you are. How blessed we are. He said, folks, remember that. First of all, wake up. Remember the Lord. He is awesome. And he is great. And then he says, and remember this. You are fighting for your brethren, for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Remember why you're doing it. Take a look around you. Look at your spouse. Look at your kids. Look at your family. And you say, well, my kids are grown. Still look at them because you've got to fight for them. Amen. He said, remember, you're fighting for these people. You've got to do everything within your power. Even if they want it or not, you still have to do it for them. Because again, I'm here to tell you, Satan is after your kids. And I believe so many times we're tempted as parents to say, well, we've done all we can do. It's now up to them. Folks, listen, it should not be up to your kids to be defended. Your kids shouldn't have to fight for themselves. We should fight for them. That's what Nehemiah said, fight for them. Satan is after them. I, for one, want to win. Amen? Amen. I want to win for my kids. I want to win for your kids. I want the church to be winning for our kids. Because here's, I, I warned in the first service, and I'll close with this. Somebody's going to win your kids. Somebody's winning. Hey, there's not going to be a stalemate for your kids. There's not going to be a draw for your kids. Somebody's winning. Either Satan is going to win your kids and take them away from you and take them into stuff that the society wants, or you are by winning with, for God. Amen? I think sometimes we think, well, if we just leave it alone, it'll be all right. No, Satan is going to win. Listen to what he's telling them. Listen to what they're learning. Listen to what they're watching. Listen to what they're listening to. And you want to tell me that you think that if you take your hands off, Satan is going to leave them alone? Absolutely not. He wants them, and he is going after them. And the only way that we can win for our kids is to guard our kids. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God speaking to us. Stand up. Be strong. Focus on them. Declare the victory through Jesus Christ. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. Amen. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in your family. If he is the center of your family, man, you build your family around Christ. And I promise you, greater is he that is there than he who is coming from out here. Amen. But we better 
be fighting because Satan is fighting and somebody, somebody, somebody has to win. Who's going to win? Can I tell you this, and I promise you this time I'm done. Can I tell you this? The only way, <clears throat> the only way Satan can win is if you surrender. If you give up. Amen? He's lost. The battle of the war is lost. The only way he can win your kids is if you surrender them over to him. That's it. You fight for them. Remember, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your family. Fight for your homes. Fight for your nation. Fight, my friends. Fight. Dads, fight. Moms, fight. But it's not a physical battle. Do not go trying to get in shape, but go spiritually knowing that we're wrestling against Satan. My friends, would you do it today? Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come today, God, this is a very serious time in our service this morning. And I pray with all my heart that everyone here, everyone watching, would understand the seriousness of this battle that we're waging. The Lord, on this very special Father's Day, the Lord, we would have men rise up. We would have men say, I, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to lose. We have moms ready to stand up and say, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to lose. We as children will stand up and say, we're not going to lose our families. We're going to fight. But God, it starts with having you in our hearts. And I pray if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, they would come today. Father, they would, they would arm themselves with your spirit and come to receive you into their lives. Father, I also pray for those who say they're willing to fight, that, Lord, they would understand this is a spiritual battle, not physical. Lord, we need to surrender our lives to you. We need to put you in the center of our lives and put you in the center of our family. And, Lord, let you protect us as we stay on guard. Be vigilant. Father, I pray for our church that we would, we would do whatever it takes to, to work and to protect families in this church, to draw families into the protection of this church because of your protection of us. That we can win the battle. Lord, let us begin to win right now. As we get ready to sing, as God speaks to your heart, man, would you come? I'll be down here ready to pray for you, pray with you. Pray about family members, whatever it is, or if you want to come and commit your heart to him, we'll be down front. We're ready for you. Father, hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing?